Lewis is recording this as well, um, and he is going to be posting it to YouTube when we've, uh, I think about 12 o'clock, so that people who miss this can actually see it on YouTube as well. Mainly because we're trying to build our YouTube channel uh, as a church. If you haven't already, you know, even if you don't normally subs- um, watch it, if you could just subscribe, uh, it means a lot to us, because once we hit the magic 100 subscribers, it opens up some, uh, or unlocks some uh, things inside of YouTube that allow us to access some features, and I don't know how it all works, but you, you tech people will. So, so we really want people to, even if you never watch YouTube, if you can just subscribe to our channel, then it just will unlock stuff so that we can connect more effectively with those who do. We want to reach as many people as we can. Okay, let's jump into the questions. <clears throat> wow, some great questions. Let's take the easy ones first, shall we? It's always good to ease our way in. Um, can I give an update on what's happening when we move to level two? Absolutely. The survey results really are showing that the overwhelming majority of people want to have a 8.30 and 10.30 start rather than a 9 and an 11 o'clock start. So if you were one of those people who was hoping for a 9 o'clock start, an 11 o'clock start uh, because you wanted to sleep in, well, you can still sleep in and join the uh, the 10.30 if 8.30 8.30 is too early for you. Uh, the reason that we wanted to do a two-hour uh, changeover was purely and simply for this. Uh, once we were allowed to, and under level two, uh, I'm not sure that we will be, but once we're allowed to, the goal is to actually have morning tea between the services so that people can still have fellowship, so that uh, people can hang around after the 8.30 and people can come a little bit early for the 10.30 and there's a chance to interact with each other, mingle with each other as we continue to build community, both online and off. So, so that's why we chose to our gap, uh, and but it, we will be going to an eight thirty and a ten thirty. So, look out for that. Okay, uh, what's next? Let's look for another easy one, shall we? As we warm up um, on Thrive, you talked about looking beyond a body to see the person. How do you do that? That's a great question. Um, and first of all, can I just say I, I really appreciate that the, that you're watching Thrive and that you're engaging with it, and, and I, I really appreciate your taking the time to to ask uh, the question. Um, how do I look beyond a body and see a person? I, I think really it's just attending to them. Um, this this is what I do. Um, you know, I, I make a point of tr- whenever I can of carrying loose change in my pocket so that I can stop and I can put it in, I can put it in them if they are uh, a beggar, for example, someone's, someone's um, begging. So that uh, what it does is, it's not going to change their world, but it lets them know that I see them, that I'm not just walking by them, I'm seeing them as a person. Um, when I walk down the street, when, I, when I'm just seeing people uh, as I walk by, one of the things that I, I do as a discipline, I guess, that I've developed for myself is that when I see people, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just say a prayer uh, in my mind for them. And if I, I'm walking down the street and I see someone I know, for example, for uh, I could be walking down Lambton Quay and, and I might walk past you and you could be on your way to a meeting as, as I might be, and we haven't got time to stop and talk. What I'm going to do is I carry on walking. I'm actually going to be praying for you and just lift you up to the Lord. Lord, would you bless them? Would you just, you know, you know what's going on in their life? Would you meet whatever need there is? Would you, whatever it is? And, and because what it does is it, it, it helps me move beyond just a, a casual how's it going and just remembering, hey, you're a real person uh, with real needs and we have a real God who wants to step into those. And, and so that's what I do. Um, if you've been down Cuba Street or around town with my wife at all, you'll know that it's, um, she, she pushes it even further and she stops and talks to, to people, particularly the down and outers, um, just to let them know they still have meaning and value. They may be down on life, uh, but, but God is not down on them. And, and there's this awareness that she represents Jesus and, and so she engages them. So, so th- that's just how, th- th- that's what we do to move beyond just seeing a body to a person uh, so that we, we're actually engaging and reminding ourselves, uh, this person's made in the image of God as much as me, that this person is as, as important to God a- a- as we are. Okay, um, let's, let's have a look. I, I guess we should go to the top. Am I brave enough? Um, what do you say? Why do you say that we need rules around the faith? Isn't believing in Jesus enough? That's a good question. That's a good question. I, I guess 
I, I guess I'd want to preface it by saying, you know, I, I, what, it, what that question sort of, how it sounds to me is as though, like, I just want to live my, my life on, you know, with God on my terms. And, and I get that, I honestly do. But, but if you just back away from that for a moment and, and just look at life, and just take Jesus out of it for a moment, you know, you're living life now with a set of rules. Everybody lives with rules. The question is, whose rules? Um, we've, we've all got a set of rules. If you're in a relationship right now, you have a set of rules. Um, there's no question about that. You have, there, there are certain things you expect and certain things that, if they're, they're not honoured, there, there are consequences for. Uh, if you're dating, for example, and the person you're dating um, you know, steps out with someone else, uh, there's consequences, isn't there? They can't just do what they want because there's a, there's a rule in place. Even if you've never spoken to them, the assumption is that if you're dating, um, then you don't see other people. And so you've got rules. You have work, rules at work. You, there, there are societal rules. Everybody lives by rules. The question is, by whose? And, and so when I hear people say, you know, what does it matter about, about the scriptures and everything else? Um, really what it's saying to me personally is that, that people are at, where they're at in life and faith is, is they are struggling to let go of the life that they've made for themselves and begin to embrace the fullness of a life that Jesus has for them. Because what it says is that I've tried fitting Jesus into my life, but it's uncomfortable because uh, the things that I, I read about in Scripture and the things I hear in sermons and everything else and my friends who are Christians talk about um, just make me feel uncomfortable. And, and that's a good thing. That's a good sign because what it's saying is that um, you, you're butting up against the limitations of the rules that you've created uh, and the rules that God has for us. And God's rules are always far more life-giving and far more generous than, than we often imagine. You know, and if you read the scriptures, if, if for example, in the New Testament, if you think about that, every time there's a don't do this, there's always something better put in place. You know, so for example, you know, for young people, if, if you're watching this and you're a young person and you're thinking, you know, but, you know, I love my life and I love going out, hanging out with my friends. And, you know, if I just go out clubbing and I just have one too many, what does it matter? You know, have you ever noticed that when Jesus says, don't get drunk, Paul says, um, but you can on the Holy Spirit. You see, the Bible always replaces something with something better, in my view. And, and so um, it's, it's, it's not to restrict us, it's to protect us and to enhance our, our life and, and the fullness that God has for us. It sort of ties into um, that question, I guess, too, here. You, you refer to the Bible as a set of rules. What if the rules are out of date and, and how do you decide which ones to follow and, and which ones not to? It's a good question. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good question. I, I guess I, when it comes to the scriptures and, and how do we approach them, I, I want to begin by saying that you know, one of the things that we need to recognize is that God is the same yesterday, today and tomorrow. There's no changing in God. But... It doesn't mean to say that the way he, he um, engages uh, and the way that he interacts with us doesn't change. Uh, so we see in the scriptures that he interacts and, and he engages with, with uh, his people in uh, the Old Testament one way. He engages with us another way. Um, what doesn't change is his character. What doesn't change is his values. What doesn't change is, uh, is his moral compass, if you will. These things never change. And, and I think it's wrong to look at this or inappropriate to look at the scriptures and just see them as, as time-bound things. Because I think what we're doing is we're, we're missing something really important. Um, we've got to remember that the Old Testament, the, the law, the Mosaic law, if, uh, if we want to call it that, or, well, we don't want to call it that, it is called that. But the Mosaic Law, for example, uh, it's, it has three components to it. It, it has a, a ceremonial component, which is about how to worship and how to, how to offer sacrifice right so that we can be uh, re reconnected with God after, after sin. It, it deals with uh, civil responsibilities and, and how to uh, be a good neighbour and how to deal with one another honestly and, and appropriately so that everybody's well-being is safeguarded and, and no Nobody is at, the, um, at risk of being exploited by other people. And, and of course, it has a, a moral dimension to it as well. And, and I want to say that because God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, 
what and his character's not changing, his values aren't changing. The way that those those three things are expressed in the Old Testament um, aren't necessarily expressed the same way in the New Testament. So of course the ceremonial laws we don't keep those anymore because Jesus fulfilled them. The civil laws have been replaced by by laws of state, really. Uh, remember, Israel was like a, a state. It was a country, and these were its civil rules. And, and, and now these are being replaced for you and I, although some of the, the principles beneath those hasn't been replaced. You know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto... Uh, uh, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Uh, your, your responsibilities to watch out for the well-being of others. I don't think these have been um, been replaced. And of course, then you've got the, the moral. And, and I think the moral laws have not been changed. I think they go right through um, from the Old Testament, right through into the New Testament to today. And, and it's because they are universal. That they're not just related by, to a particular group of people in a particular time. Um, that, they, that they're greater than that. Um, so, so it means that when we talk about God's rules, we, we need to be clear. We're not just talking about the Mosaic law as, as prescribed for ceremonial and, and civil things. We're talking about something greater than that uh, from our point of view as Christians. We're talking about the moral law and, and how, we, how we live out of that today. Um, so for the, the moral law, for example, uh, apart from the law of the Sabbath, or, or the other nine commandments of, of the Ten Commandments all find expression and are all explicitly stated and, uh, and given new meaning in, in many ways in the New Testament. And, and so that alone should, should help us recognise that these are universal, that these are, these are not something that we, can, we have the right to say, OK, let's ring fence them, they're, they're, they're 2,000 years old, they have no bearing today. They have bearing on us all. Issues the, the the laws around sexuality. You know, it's so easy for us to to try and say, well, that's Old Testament; it doesn't apply to us. Or to take, for example, um, what Paul said and then reword it and everything else, and and just try and again ring fence it and keep it into a particular time and context, as though it doesn't apply to us. And and I want to say that when we do that, we are actually denying uh, that the basis of our faith. You know, you take for example. Um, the law around homosexuality in the Old Testament. The reason I say that it's actually a universal thing, it's, it's, it's talked about in the very same breath as bestiality and, and child slavery. Uh, uh, sorry, not child slavery, um, child sacrifice. Now, if you want to say that um, we don't, we're not bound by, the, by, the, by that Old Testament, we're not bound by that because you're seeing it as you're not seeing it as a universal moral law, but you're seeing it as, a, as something that's out of date, it's, it's bound to a particular time and, and context, then what are you going to do about child sacrifice? Because it's, it's in the, same, it's in the same, same, same group. Are you going to say that um, child sacrifice is now acceptable, bestiality is now acceptable? Um, and, and the reason I say that is that really what we're talking about is that we see that these laws, they're written in the, in the scriptures, but they are universal they're not just for a particular group of people in a particular time. The moral laws are for all of us. And, and so to say that, um, how do we decide which ones to follow and which ones not to? We don't need to follow the ceremonial laws. We don't need to follow the civil laws as they're written. But we do need to abide by them by the moral laws, and the moral laws frame uh, our faith. They frame everything that Jesus talked about, the Beatitudes and the, the Sermon on the Mount, so much of Paul's teaching that you and I would accept as 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 being foundations for life. It's all issues out of that, uh, an understanding of the universal moral law of God. Because he's the creator of the heavens and the earth and he made all of us in his image, his laws are for the whole of humanity. So, so, so I think we need to, instead of just saying, well, you know, uh, they're out of date, we need to say, actually, no, maybe the issue is not the law. Maybe it's my response to it because... Uh, it's, it's pricking my conscience. It doesn't. It's not allowing me to do live my life on my terms. It's it's calling me to examine myself and to say, well, okay, but maybe maybe God's got a way that I'm ignorant of, or maybe I need to get my head around the fact that as much as society may say one thing, God's perspective, which is unchanging and eternal. Uh, is the one that I need to learn to wrestle with and align myself with. And, and I'll be the first to admit, as in today's uh, society, that that's, it's not popular, it's easier said than done, but, but I can tell you that this, this world is fleeting, eternity's not. It's better to discipline oneself today and, and limit oneself uh, in the eyes of society 
and if you want to, to, to use that term, to feel like you're missing out on something or to cost you some relationships, than it is to um, forfeit eternity. There's, uh, hopefully that, that makes sense. It's a great question, but, and it's, a, it's an ongoing question. Um, yeah, it, it's good. Um, what's, another, what's another question here? How would you go about choosing people to help you grow as a person? That's a great question. You guys ask really great questions. And again, it, it really excites and encourages me as a pastor because, you know, it's as a pastor, it's, it's my desire to see people grow into the fullness of, of who God's made them to be. You know my, my mantra, I just want to help you become the best version of you that God created you to be. And I think this question just reflects that. So how, what would I do? Well, I, I guess really what we're talking around here is, is mentoring, aren't we? Um, how, how do we choose our mentors? How do we choose people that um, are going to help us grow? And, and I think it begins by recognising where we're at. Um, you know, if, if you're a, 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 a newish believer, then, then uh, you've got to, you can choose, you want to choose people who are mature in their faith and understand um, the world in which you live and how to how to bring uh, the, the scriptures and faith and, and the world in which you live together in meaningful ways that help you make sense of your world so that you're no longer bound and limited by your world but are able to uh, to grow into the fullness of, of who God's called you to be and live out of the kingdom of heaven. Um, so so I, I, I want to say that I, I begin by, by looking, looking for someone who, who I trust Somebody whose um, whose life stacks up. Somebody who, who who's solid all the way through. You know that they're, they're there right through. Um, if you scratch them, they're the same. They're not one way around one group of people, another way around another group of people. You want someone who's that, that you can trust. Who's and, and you want someone as a consequence of that. They're there for you. You see, my, my I'm, I'm wedded to this concept that. When it comes to growing in our faith and, and walking out God's plans and purposes for our life, that, that one size doesn't fit all. Because if you think about this for a moment, if we accept the premise, and, and, and you know that this is, this is a, a deeply held um, commitment of mine, that, that I'm deeply wedded to this, that if, if God has fearfully and wonderfully created us and we're unique, um, handcrafted uh, masterpieces of him, then it means that the way God's wired us is unique. So one size can't fit all. You know, one of the things that I, I when I was growing up, um, we lived in rural New Zealand. We, there was no shops around. My mother used to make our clothes. Uh, we, we were, my father was a principal back in those days. Um, uh, the, the two lowest group of professionals in terms of employment status, uh, pay was teachers and bankers. I think it's totally different now. Um, so what it meant was I used to get my brother's hand-me-downs. And, um, you know, what, what used to annoy me about that was as I could live with their clothes. It was the colours. You know, the colours, didn't their colours they chose because mum would make our clothes. Um, we got to choose the fabric. And so, you know, I'd get my brother's hands off and hand-me-downs and, and the colour never really went with me. But um, it just you know it just felt weird, and, and I say that simply because one size doesn't fit all. So when it comes to um, finding someone who can help you grow as a person, find someone who's who's there for you, who's not going to say, okay, this is this is what you have to do. Step one, step two, step three, step four. Um, there's a place for some of that, but they the ratio of certain things is going to look different in your life to my life. There are universal principles. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love others as yourself. But the outworking of that is going to, to look a little bit different in your life and mine. What does it mean to, to, sh to, 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 to show mercy and, and, and everything else? You see, some of you have, an, uh, have a... Um, a motivational gift of mercy, and it just flows from you. And so, uh, you know, when when you're growing, somebody can just help you soar in that. Whereas someone like me, who, you know, it, it's a hard work, and I need someone who can help bring that out in, in ways that they wouldn't have to in someone else. And so, all I'm saying is that you, you've got to find someone who's there for you, someone that you trust. And I also think that when I'm choosing people, I, it's one thing to choose people that you trust. Um, you need to do them the courtesy of listening. I mentor a lot of people, and um, 
at various points, it doesn't happen often though, but uh, I've had people who, you know, they've asked me for my uh, for, for my um, support and encouragement, they've asked me to mentor them, and, and that's fine, happy to do that. But it becomes apparent that, you know, we, we meet up, we talk, we, we pray together, and nothing's changing. They're not actually trying to build anything into their life. And, and so if they're not willing to listen, then I'm wasting my time. So um, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And all I'm saying is when you choose people, make sure you choose people that you're that you trust, but give them the courtesy of listening to them as well. And and, and know what you're asking of them. You see, if there, there are some things that um, people just can't help us with. Not because it's too big a thing, it's just that they're wired differently. Um, you know, you've got to know what it is that you're asking. If, if you if, if you want to ask surround yourself with people who are going to help you grow, be clear about what your what your expectations are fr from the different people that you're surrounding yourself with. Are you wanting them to hold you accountable in, in a particular area? Um, well, be clear about that and, and then give them permission to do that. Are you are you wanting there to give them uh, are you wanting to them to help you apply your faith in a particular context? So for example, if if you're working in a in, in a corporate setting, then you want someone who can who understands your setting to be able to help you apply your faith in that situation. So you know you just got to be clear, um, and then of course surrounding yourself with people who who can encourage you and, and just um, just help you through the ups and downs of life. I, I hope that makes some sense. I, one size doesn't fit all, but but when it comes to mentoring, I, I think it. You know, it, we do need more than one or two. Uh, I think that it's good to have a group around us who can who can help us grow together. If if, if I haven't quite answered your question, feel free just to um, post uh, seek clarification. Post a secondary question. You know, you've got Slido there. That's fine. Okay, um, let's let's have a look here. Okay, let me just come down here. I was surprised you said not to focus on goals. I think they're good. I find the Great Commission is too overwhelming for a person to have as their only goal. Um, yeah, I, that's an interesting perspective. I would want to say, really, um, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm, I struggle a little with that because if your focus is not the Great Commission then your goal is not necessarily God's goal for your life at all. Everything about yours and my life is, it flows out of the Great Commission. So if you're not going to say, if you're, if you're not going to take that as your primary goal, my goal is to, is to live out of the Great Commission, then whatever other goal you set, as good as it may be, um, you may, it may not bring you to where you want to go. When we get to heaven, one of the things that's going to happen is that, you know, we think of judgment, and maybe we should do it. Yeah, maybe, no, we'll definitely do a series on this, I think. When we think of judgment, we tend to just think of in or out, you know, eternal destinations. And, and certainly that's, that, that, is, that is the case. But then the, for believers, there is a, a series of judgments. It's not just, okay, you're in, you know, here's, here's, here's the robe, here's the key to your mansion, um, you know, just mind the, mind the gold path, um, enjoy the rest of eternity. There, we are judged by our works. And so if your goal is actually um, as noble as it may be, if it's not connected to, to God's primary goal, then when you come to the judgment for works, you may find that, that the things that God had for you, um, you, you've stepped outside of and you miss some of the, the greatest rewards that, that could be there for you because you've, um, you've missed the big picture. And, and so all I'm saying is that Start with the Great Commission. So, so, my, um, so, so for me, I'm, I'm very clear. The Great Commission is to go into the world and make disciples, teaching them to obey Jesus, um, follow him, and baptize them, etc. So, so how does that find expression in my life? Okay, so as a pastor, I'm very, very clear. My goal, my, my goal is to equip others for that. Um, and part of that means helping you become the best version of you that you can be because when you are the best version of you that you can be and living out of the fullness of who God has made you, then you're more effective at bearing witness to Jesus and fulfilling the Great Commission. 
Um, and, with, and within that, then I, I break that f down further and I have particular goals. How am I going to achieve that? What's it going to look like? But it starts with the Great Commission. And so for you, um, you know, you, you really do need to, to, to have an awareness that whatever goals you set, if they are not um, work bringing you towards the Great Commission, um, then I think you probably need to take a step back and, and say, well, you know, as good as that goal is, is it God's goal for me or is it just one of those things that I thought was a good idea? I'm not trying to tell you off or anything like that. I'm just saying that I just want to encourage you. Always have to live against the backdrop of the Great Commission, the backdrop of eternity. Okay. Um, these are all good questions that are left. Um, um, okay. What if, what if you completely fall off the wagon during this race? How do you be, how do you begin and get back into it? You know, I think I think we've all been there if we're honest, haven't we? We've all um, we've all felt like we've disqualified ourselves. We've we've all uh, done something we know we shouldn't have done, or or said something, or uh, whatever it is. I think all of us could identify with a point where we have fallen off the wagon, so to speak. Uh, but the good news is that uh, we, we read in 1 John that, this is, that, that um, when we confess our sins, God is faithful and, for, and just, will forgive us and cleanse us and put us back in the race. So all you have to do is to recognise um, that you've fallen off and, and get back in. That, that's, 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 that's that simple. It's, it's when you kid yourself and say, well, you know what, it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to chart my own course from here on. That's when you've got problems. But if, if you know that you've fallen off, um, just pick yourself up, recognize it, confess it, and, and the scriptures are clear. God is faithful and just. He will forgive you and cleanse you uh, um, and basically just put you back in the race. So, uh, But you, you've got to take that first step. How do you get the right balance between doing, between doing and through spending time in God? Like Mary and Martha. That's a good one. Um, how do you get the right balance? You know, I, I, I guess one of the things I'd want to say is this, this concept of balance is, is not a biblical thing, okay? I just want to be up front with that. You, you don't find balance in, in the scriptures. You know, you're, you're all in. Um, you're all in. So you're all into being Mary, you're all into being Martha, and you're all into being both of those at the same time. If that, if, if that, if that makes sense. Um, so... So, so what it really means is that, I guess as I hear this, you know, how do you, how do you, um, how do you make sure that you're not so busy doing all the time that you're not spending time with Jesus? And how do you make sure that, some, that you're not just spending time with Jesus and neglecting work? And, and how do you keep that rhythm appropriate for how God's wired you? Um, and, and, and I guess, I guess the, the way that I would do it is that... Um, I would again. It's just being aware of of life around you. It's having mentors and people who can speak into your life and tell you when you when you when you haven't got that rhythm right. I think if you're genuinely seeking after God, He helps you know that you haven't got that rhythm right. Um, the Holy Spirit will convict you and 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 help you in that. So um, I, I I think there's I think there's always going to be a tension between being and doing. And it's just learning to live with that tension in a healthy way rather than trying to satisfy it by being either or. I'm this now and then later I'll be this. But it's, it's, it's living with that healthy creative tension between um, I need to be in order to do and in doing I then become. And, and on it goes. It's just like that, if, if that makes sense. That's been my experience. Um, I'm just going to ask, I actually have an assistant today, uh, I'm just going to ask my, my, my assistant um, if he could bring back, I, I saw a question or a statement by, um, by Jean, I think, about the Great Commission on, on screen. Uh, sorry, my glasses, um, one of the first things I do when I come out of lockdown is I'm not going for a coffee, I'm going to the optometrist because my glasses are no longer functioning as the way they're meant to function. So um, let me just, excuse me, let me just bring up this question because I, I think it's a great question. Great. Yep. The Great Commission is the mission statement from which all the strands' goals should flow out of. Thank you, Jean. I, 
She's, she's just such an inspiration and encouragement. If you're looking for a mentor, you should see Jean and, and, and Willie. Both of them together are an incredible package, honestly. The, their wisdom and their humility, but also um, the depth of faith is, is just an incredible, uh, an incredible gift to, well, to me, but also to the church as a whole. Um, that's a great way of framing it. Thank you, Jean. How do we get the, um, I've done that, the right balance? Um, where are the time here? What are, what should we say to young people who are thinking about what they should do with their lives after high school? Wow, what a great question. What should we... How do you engage, how do you advise a, a, your teenagers and, um, or, or youth around how to invest their life? That's really what you're talking about. I, I, made, the, I made the decision when our kids were teenagers that I was not going to talk about careers. I was going to talk about investing their lives. What is it that you want to invest your life in? Um, I'll back you in whatever you want to do, but you've got to show me how you are investing your life in God's plans and purposes uh, that flow out of the Great Commission. Um, and so, so the I'll, I'll tell you the advice that I gave. I, I, I gave our kids, um, and, and it may be helpful, it may not be. And I'll limit it to to one because you can you can unpack this with you because you, you're going to see it when you come out of lockdown um, I remember very vividly as a um, young 14 year old uh, I had a I was at church and, and my, my PA knew that all my family members had unrestricted access to me they did not have to make appointments they did not have to phone if I was in an appointment they could just come she could just bring them straight in because they were my priority and, and I wanted people to understand that and, and my, my PA um, rang through my office one, one day in the afternoon and she said I've got Miriam here and I said oh yes and she said no she wants to make an appointment to see you um, at which point I thought my gosh and I said should I be worried and, and she said, I, I think you should. And so my, my mind is racing over time. So long story short, Miriam comes to me with a, with, a, with a mission plan, 14 years old, with a mission plan. She, she, um, she, she came and she sat me down, and uh, she sat me down in my office. And she said, Dad, you always said that I could be whatever I wanted to be. I could do whatever I wanted to do so long as I was using my gifts and skills to the glory of God. And I said, yep. And then, um, and, and it, she was in a streamed class, okay? So she was my last hope for one of my kids going to university and, and following in my footsteps, so to speak. And then she drops this big bombshell. She says, Dad, I want to be a hairdresser. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay. And I, for the only time in my life, I've taken my own advice and I, and I, I didn't say a word. And, and what happened was, she then proceeded to lay out this, this, this mission plan about how, as a hairdresser, she would be having people every day sitting in front of her in a seat, with struggling with life, with questions, with all sorts of issues, and they would open up to her and she would be able to, to minister God's grace to them. That they weren't just clients, they, um, that they were people that she could evangelize by the way and she engaged with them and everything else. And I'm sitting there thinking, Wow. And so, long story short, she'd already gone to the top hairdressing salon in, in Wellington and made an appointment. She'd, she'd set up uh, an apprenticeship and everything else ready for, um, for, for when she left uh, school and everything else. She had it all mapped out. Um, and I backed her um, because it wasn't about the job, it was about the Great Commission. Um, she was wanting to invest her life in an area where it wasn't about the income, it wasn't about status. Or, uh, sure, she was going to be fulfilled, but her fulfillment wasn't coming from, from cutting hair. It was coming from touching people's lives. And, and so I, I want to suggest to you that if when you're sitting down talking to teenagers, you talk around, so, you know, what do you enjoy? How do you feel God's wired you? What, what, are you? what are your passions in life? And how might God use those to make a difference? How might God use these things to make a difference in, in other people's lives? You know, so it's not saying, okay, don't be an accountant, be a be, be an, a missionary. It's saying, no, no, if God, if that's what brings you brings you joy, and um, apparently it does for a large number of you. Uh, I don't understand that. I'll be honest. But if that's what brings you joy, then then you see it as an encourage the teenagers. Look, this is not your career. This is an opening into a mission field to be a witness to God. If, if you've got teenagers who are multi-talented, which one would bring? Which one do you think God could use most effectively? Which one would be most of most service to God uh, in the advancement of the Great Commission? Uh, that's how I would approach it. That's what advice I would give them. It's not saying um, don't go to university, don't do this, don't do that. It's saying how 
other plans that you're making going to bring you closer to the plans and purposes of God? How are you going to, is it going to work out um, your part in the Great Commission? Because that's where ultimate fulfillment comes from. That's where, um, where people's sense of worth and well-being uh, comes from, in my experience, by, by serving the purposes of God. And we live in a generation where this is needed more than any other time. I think the days are short, and we need as many people as possible there. Okay, um, one last question here. Uh, is it okay to wean ourselves off the things, the things or people that cause us to stumble rather than to cut them off completely or go, or go cold turkey? Wow. That's a great question. Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. I, and part of me is thinking, you know, do I, do I jump in or do I be tactful? Um, when have I been known to be tactful? Um, you know, I, 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 what I hear is, 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 is somebody saying, I know that this relationship, or I know this activity is, 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 is holding me back, but I don't want to let this person down, or I don't want to let the team down, or I don't know how to disengage. Um, in my experience, uh, generally, cold turkey is best. You, because what happens is that you start with a, with a desire um, to to change. You start with a desire to, to grow. You start with a desire to, to let go of some things in order to pick some other habits up or become a better version of you um, and geez, whatever, whatever your motivation is. Um, and the thing is that initially those people are going to let you, but then when you start becoming just a, a little bit too different, where you become like a mirror and you're reflecting back to them the, the, the very things that they shouldn't be. Um, they get uncomfortable and they want to pull you back. They don't want you to change. They don't want you to grow because if you grow, then they, it exposes things in their lives as well. Uh, and so I, I think cold turkey is the best because uh, then you, it's hard, I know, but, but if you do that, then you can begin to use that time, uh, for example, to fill it with something else, uh, something constructive, something that's going to help bring you closer to, to God, uh, build new relationships, join a connect group, hang um, under 30s club, whatever it is, uh, and surround yourself with people who of faith who can encourage you and, and, and help you build a deeper relation and more meaningful relationships. Will it feel weird initially? Absolutely. But I think my, the people I know and my observations and experiences trying to do it, cold, uh, trying to do it gradually, um, it, it just doesn't work. It's, it's just really difficult. So, uh, yeah... I think that's. Um, I think we've. I think we've done all the questions there. So um, yeah, I just want again. I, I just want to say how 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 humbled I am that um, by the way you guys are grappling with with faith and life and and through this series, it's been it's been really encouraging to me, and I'm, I'm really excited for you guys because what what it's telling me is is that you're you're positioning yourself for the fullness of, of life that God has for you, that you want more, that the status quo is, is, has lost some of its charm and that you, you don't want to just go through the motions. Uh, and it really excites me that, that you really want to, to break out and, and you know, you, God's going to honour that in your life and in the life of our church. And, and I'm so excited for what that means. So uh, I just want to encourage you. And again, I, you know, I'm so grateful for you giving me this time. Uh, as, as I say, it's a precious commodity. It's not renewable, and uh, I don't want to. I, I don't take it for granted. So, so bless you and enjoy whatever comes next in your day.